Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Over the next 45 minutes, we hope to provide you with many insights to think about over the weekend. I'm Helena Conradi, CEO of Satrix, and I will once again be your host for this second webinar under the Index More initiative. Before I tell you about uh, more about Index More and introduce you to our speaker for today, I would like to share some exciting news with you. As part of the huge build-up to our 20th birthday celebrations on the 27th of November, we are in the process of listing a few new ETFs. And this week, we opened the IPO for the Satrix MSCI China ETF. This is our 17th exchange traded fund and the fifth in our global range. So all five global feeder funds replicate the relevant index by investing in the underlying iShares funds. And this growing global range of funds laid the foundation for a wonderful opportunity called Index More. This is a, an educational collaboration between us, Satrix, and BlackRock iShares, the largest ETF provider globally. So the intention is really to provide appropriate and targeted content that speaks to more than just index investing. So for that reason, introducing the Index More concept. Last month, we kicked off the discussions with a focus on mega trends, one of them being the shift in economic power from west to east. Today, we are zooming in on the east to China, uh, one of the biggest investment opportunities out there um, today. So our speaker for today um, is Wei Li. Uh, she is head of EMEA Investment Strategy for BlackRock ETF and Index Investments. Her team's responsibilities include delivering ETF investment ideas and market insights to institutional clients and financial advisors. So very much what she's going to do today. And she is also a frequent contributor on Bloomberg TV and CNBC. But the next part of her CV, though, had me in a complete state of awe. She is a two-time mathematical Olympiad gold medalist from China. So if ever you've wanted to ask those mind-boggling questions about China, today is your day. So just post them in the question, the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, so Wei, it's, uh, thank you very much. It's a real honor having you. And we are very eager to find out why China, why now? Over to you. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction, uh, as Helena said, uh, um, only questions about China, not about mathematics. That was a long time ago. Thank you for having me and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in the next half an hour or so, I will take you through the specific investment case for China and more broadly, uh, as we head into the second half of this extraordinary year, uh, our view of the world uh, that very much kind of influences uh, our view uh, on China. So. If you look at uh, the fact that we're coming out of uh, the back of an extraordinary six month, uh, six, six month in markets. Oh, sorry. I think there's some technical issue. Start video. Just a sec. Um, apologies. I don't know what happened over here. Um, sorry. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. That's right. Now we can see your yes. video as well. It's perfect. Sorry, I have uh, apologies for the, for the technical uh, issue. Um, perfect. Um, we'll talk about our view uh, on China. And, and I want to broadly set the scene uh, a little bit because um, this year very much is extraordinary in that the structural changes that are impacting the world of investment and also uh, the world of, uh, 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 that we live in are being accelerated by, uh, by COVID. So normally the structural changes are slow moving and we don't have to worry about them right now, but because they're impacting uh, us right now, we have to consider them uh, right now. So really I want to paint a picture of uh, uh, the present running towards the future very quickly. And by the structural changes that are being accelerated right now, I meant the trend of deglobalization, the shift to more domestic supply chains, 
as countries look to be less uh, interdependent. Um, and for China in particular, this means an acceleration of the decoupling of the US-China economies and, and also uh, uh, the, the, the frosty tension between the su two superpowers will be here to stay. So all of that to, 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 to say that um, there are reasons to be cautious, but we're cautiously optimistic uh, on China because the investment opportunity is too big uh, to ignore. Uh, and in fact, the decoupling that is being accelerated right now means that it is even more important to hold China as a standalone allocation in portfolios. So all of that, just to say, this is a, a great webinar that, uh, that they've been joint, jointly uh, organized is really timely in that it's, it's, it's a great time to be talking about China right now. Um, so on the whole, what do we expect for the second half? We're seeing a disconnect between fundamentals and market uh, movement, but this doesn't cause us too much concern. And the reason for that is because even though, as you can see here on the, on the slide, the initial impact from COVID uh, to a growth trajectory is very sharp, the recovery is expected to be reasonably swift as well, because we're talking about a reopening of the economy, not recovery in a traditional sense. And because of that, the cumulative impact on uh, growth, uh, in our view, is going to be only just a fraction of the cumulative impact on growth from global financial crises. So despite the fact that we're seeing a bit of a disconnect between markets pushing higher and fundamentals still reflecting the impact of COVID, we think that, um, uh, that there, is, uh, there is a very good case to be made that we have to stay invested because uh, of the fact that the cumulative impact from COVID is just going to be a fraction of a, a global financial crisis. Um, and there are a few reasons uh, to be cautious, and I will speak to that uh, a, a bit more, but it's very important to bear in mind that what is happening uh, right now, the reason that we're reasonably uh, constructive around the, the, the rebound uh, on growth uh, is that central bank policy has provided a bridge through the crisis. Uh, so let's take a step back to look at what central banks have done. So for context, it took the Fed seven years to grow their balance sheet from two trillion to four point four trillion dollars, and just three months to make announcements that would take the balance sheet from four trillion to eleven trillion by the year end. This is really unprecedented. And what is more, uh, Powell, Fed, uh, Fed Chairman Powell, has described the actions taken by the Fed as modest, indicating that they have more tools to come. So what is really clear. Uh, is that uh, more than ever, uh, this discussion of uh, central banks, uh, are they uh, exhausting their toolkit, is a bit pointless because they do have a lot of tools in their toolkit. It just takes a crisis for them to get their acts together. And this bridge of support uh, really helped turn the worst quarterly return in the first quarter to be followed by a very sharp rebound, the best quarterly return uh, in, uh, in, in, in decades. So this is, I want to kind of set the broader seen before we dive into the case of uh, investing, uh, investing in China, which is very relevant right now. So here, what we see is um, now we have been advocating for some time on the need for coordination of fiscal and monetary policy to keep the next crisis at bay. And we put out a thought leadership piece on this exact topic last year, which proposed a framework for combining monetary policy and fiscal policy. And it is extremely encouraging to see that the coordination playing out this year. So what does this huge policy response mean for us allocation? Aside from a huge boost central bank policies have given to credit, the hunt for income is on. We know the role of government bonds in portfolios are now changing a little bit before, uh, 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 b because the room for yields to come uh, down even further is perhaps a bit more limited, but there is an insatiable demand for income. Uh, so where do we look? I will go into this in greater detail, but in our view, the role for China government bonds in a, a, a global portfolio um, in the context of rates low for longer, in the context of this search for income being even greater, uh, it really positions uh, China government bonds uh, very well in this, uh, in this context. And I want to make sure that I set the scene uh, for that before deep diving uh, in this a little bit more uh, later. And now let's move from the non, which is a policy response, to the unknown. 
And the spread of COVID uh, uh, virus is uh, uh, is characterized in 2020, and no one working in finance is a virologist. So uh, we try to get a better grasp of uh, of what's happening here. Uh, and at BlackRock, we use big data, activity, and high frequency models to monitor and predict the path forward. And what we're seeing is really a, a very homogeneous initial reaction uh, in that almost every country has implemented some sort of rather thorough lockdown measure. Uh, but the path out of that is going to be rather het uh, heterogeneous. Uh, and here you can see the different uh, uh, paths through different countries. And the unknown here is feeding back to the data that we do know. So manufacturing PMI, a sentiment indicator for the manufacturing industry has really snapped back to expansionary territory and really taking on a V-shaped uh, recovery. The insights from our latest uh, uh, investor virtual tour to China, uh, which happened once a year, shows that internet companies have been ramping up investments uh, on new infrastructure. Economists are saying that infrastructure investments are boosting productivity. And services, on the other hand, continues to lag a little bit. And maybe here there is a bit of a behavioral consideration at place as well, uh, because we see the return to non-essential retail has been sluggish with traffic data showing us that uh, weekday traffic is back up to pre-COVID crisis, but weekend traffic remains uh, to be rather muted. And this shows that the consumer uh, uh, is not ready to return to the uh, uh, market just yet. And now this contrasts greatly with what we have seen in Europe. So uh, as the European economies have started to open up, demand has risen uh, to match capacity. Restaurants booking in Germany, for example, I just want to kind of really make the contrast between uh, uh, what we're seeing in China versus what we see uh, in Europe. Uh, for example, restaurant booking in Germany are at 70% of pre-COVID crisis uh, levels, which means that uh, especially if you take into consideration the social distancing, uh, um, the levels that we're observing right now is fairly close to the original trend. So um, moving to... Uh, uh, the, 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 the next slide, uh, while consumer uh, and consumption is lagging in China, and China has been focusing fiscal stimulus measures specifically at boosting the consumption piece, China is further along in the pandemic cycle. And this chart shows that the uh, rather heterogeneous recovery that we're seeing. China's restart of uh, activity has occurred quickly, but rather unevenly. So current production capacity utilization is about 94% of its typical level before the Lunar New Year holidays. Cement shipments and sales of heavy trucks and smartphones have rebounded above their 2020 starting point, even above the level before the, the, the lockdown. But if you look at hotel occupancy, however, uh, uh, and also look at domestic flights and subway usage, they remain rather depressed. So here, I think it's more around kind of the behavioral bias that we're talking about. Consumers not feeling comfortable, even though they can potentially go back to uh, normalcy, they are taking their time to, to, to get back to normalcy. Uh, the fiscal stimulus focus this time around is also less likely, it's very important to, 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 to recognize that, less likely to propagate across emerging markets as uh, it is more domestically focused, meaning that we're less likely to see an emerging market-wide bounce off the back of the China-specific measures. This means that there is less likely to be more differentiation. Well, there, there is actually more likely to be more differentiation in emerging markets, which means that a selective approach is really less, really, really important. And, and, and selectivity on a country basis when it comes to emerging market investing is, is the trend that we're, we're picking up uh, this year. Uh, and in general, uh, we bucket our emerging market views into roughly uh, three uh, categories. So um, we're positive on emerging market economies that are well positioned to withstand the growth shock and those with a sufficient policy space to increase fiscal and monetary easing. So particularly in emerging market Asia and China is very much well positioned in that, in that regard. And the second category in terms of EM selectivity is where our view is reliant on how well these countries manage the outbreak. Uh, 
um, um, of the of the virus. So here we're less positive. Uh, for example, on Mexico, uh, Brazil, and India, uh, these equity markets they're heavily owned. They tend to already trade at a higher valuation than other emerging markets, uh, uh, and 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 they also leaves room for greater downside uh, downside risk. And lastly, there are economies that that, that were outright negative on and may be exposed to solvency risk given the magnitude of the shock and the relative weakness of the economy. Uh, for example, Turkey and Argentina are less, uh, are less well positioned in that regard. So I want to kind of frame the discussion of China in a context of emerging market selectivity because that is really a trend that is coming through both in our client conversations and also in the flows uh, towards emerging market, which I will talk a little bit more uh, later. So. How do you be selective in emerging markets? So here we talked about, earlier on, we talked about kind of the, 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 the where they are in the pandemic curve being one differentiator. Selectivity can also be expressed at an index level through single country exposure, through uh, a, a sector exposure. So you can express selectivity by being highly exposed to, to the uh, areas of emerging markets that you like. Take this uh, chart, for example, it shows the highest allocation of emerging market to technology, which is one of our preferred sectors. And here, MSCI Korea or uh, Taiwan stands out, uh, and, and, and China too, uh, uh, the, the, the growth engine for technology is very much centered around China and the US. Think of that as the twin driver of, uh, of tech innovation in the next decade. Uh, even, especially as the two economies decouple, it makes a bigger case to own both and because everybody owns us already then it actually makes a bigger case for owning china because uh, very few uh, investors outside of china actually own china and china tech provides access to a captive audience uh, because uh, of lack of uh, privacy uh, regulation so the way that technology can roll out and very much uh, get implemented and tested and 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 and, 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 be, and, and be productionized, the, the speed of which is so much faster in China, and, 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 and that very much argues for, 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 for a greater uh, case to, 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 own more, uh, to own more China tech. And we'll talk more about it when we deep dive on China equities uh, later, but um, this is just one example of how we can be differentiated and, and use sector preference to differentiate within emerging markets and that positions uh, uh, China a while in that regard. And also, if we want access to EM consumer, using consumer discretionary as a proxy, then MSCI China, as you can see on this chart, is also uh, uh, well positioned. So from an investment and asset allocation perspective, the case for a significant role of China assets in portfolio is very clear. So as a starting point, we see even a neutral allocation to China as bigger than what is actually implied by index allocation today. The accelerating global trends in the wake of a COVID-19 shock is really increasing the urgency to reconsider the role of China in a portfolio. So here our uh, capital market um, uh, uh, assumption, uh, uh, which are quarterly assumptions that get updated on a, on a quarterly basis that looks at how much return we can expect from different uh, exposures, they take into uh, account of the longer term structural impacts uh, and, and that feeds through to uh, a portfolio construction. And you can see here that 10 year expected returns are high for China assets across equities and bonds. And there are other benefits, including diversification, which I will go into uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more later. And another consideration here is um, hedging cost for uh, international investors have come down investing in China. Uh, when we talk about uh, 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 China bonds or China equities being hatched back into the dollar or being hatched back into the euro, that hedging cost has, uh, has come down, which makes the yield pickup uh, for China bonds even more attractive. The yield pickup versus developed market is 1.5% uh, when comparing the five-year China government bonds to the next highest yielding developed market bonds, which is the five-year Italian uh, BTP, Italian government bonds. The yield differential becomes even more compelling when considering that uh, CGB, China government bonds, are rated A plus compared to the uh, triple B status for BTP, Italian government bonds. And that uh, China government bonds are also likely going to benefit from rising structural demand due to index uh, inclusion 
So bearing in mind that the vast majority of investors in China, they don't hedge uh, exposure. So, so, so we talked about currency hedging costs coming down, but sometimes uh, investors in China, they don't even hedge our currency because currency is a main driver of their investment rationale. So that actually makes the yield differential uh, uh, argument even more attractive. So the case for China is clear and the, the investors, our clients are telling us that diversification and growth uh, 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 driver, China currently drives one third of global growth and this is expected to, to increase uh, are the two main motivation for investing in China. And this is not a, not a short term story. Uh, so, 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 so government spending uh, in China has plenty of headroom to, 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 to increase as well. Digging a bit deeper, specifically into, into, into the case of China, we talked about earlier on the broader global policy response and how monetary policy and fiscal policy, they're getting coordinated uh, this year to fight uh, COVID. Um, there is one clear reason why we see that uh, uh, could uh, uh, come more uh, from China. So government spending hasn't hit the highs that we saw back in 2009 uh, uh, in response to global financial crisis. And there are two reasons for that. First, spending this time around is more targeted. And second, more cautious. This is not a throw money at a problem type of situation that we see China. China is looking to show up its economy to promote sustainable growth. And that starts with uh, uh, an active consumer. So it's a lot more targeted, which also means that there is more where that comes from. So uh, it's really rather remarkable looking at the, 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 the easing uh, measures. We see more coming from the developed market this, uh, this time, this year, than from China and, and, and leaving more room for, for China uh, to, uh, to step up. Um, and the relative uh, 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 case uh, uh, is that China can, uh, can implement a coordinated uh, response policy on the monetary front uh, uh, because they have more room is, uh, is, definitely, is definitely a plus. And this time around, the financial system is also in a better shape. So here we see that uh, uh, non-performing loan uh, NPL make up a relatively low proportion of China's uh, loan book. So non-performing loan is about... Uh, 2.6 uh, uh, trillion uh, RMB versus uh, uh, 100 and uh, uh, more than 100 trillion uh, in, uh, in, in China's uh, loan book. So it's really a small proportion. And on top of that, the, 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 the amount of uh, loan book that is vulnerable to COVID, as you can see on the left hand side of this slide, is also uh, reasonably low. So almost 71% of, uh, of the loan book is, is rather resilient and non performing long part of that uh, uh, is even smaller. So when we hear is the uh, um, uh, COVID crisis going to cause a, uh, a credit crisis, we don't, we don't think so because the financial system is in a better shape uh, right now compared to, compared to before. And now I want to kind of talk about um, access to China because uh, the, 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 the access to China has been becoming easier Historically, overseas investors have had difficulty accessing mainland China, which led to the development of the alphabet soup that you see in this, uh, in this slide. So let's break them down a little bit, but bear in mind, some of these letters may become redundant uh, as access to Asia has become a bit easier and, and the markets become more, uh, more homogenized. Uh, but Asia is the onshore market. Uh, we want to access uh, and it's most highly exposed to China consumers and it's also twice the size of the offshore market and specifically going through these alphabets uh, a bit uh, one by one to familiarize you with the different ways of access in China. We talked about Asia as being onshore pea chips that are the, uh, China securities of non-government owned companies incorporated outside of mainland China listed on Hong Kong Stock Exchange and they trade in Hong Kong dollars. Uh, N shares, they are incorporated outside of Greater China, listed on uh, uh, NYSE, Euronext, for example, uh, and they trade in dollar. And H shares, they're incorporated in mainland China, listed in Hong Kong Stock Exchange, they trade in Hong Kong dollars. And red chips, they are state-owned companies that they are incorporated outside of mainland China. 
They are listed on Hong Kong Stock Exchange and they're traded in Hong Kong uh, dollars. So these are the various ways of accessing China, but as the markets open up, maybe the alphabet soup, which can be confusing a little bit, will become a bit less, uh, uh, hopefully less relevant going forward because it becomes a lot more accessible uh, going forward for international investors. And now I want to talk about specifically the case for China equities, and I have a little deep dive session. Uh, and I will go to China debt and I will fly through in terms of the uh, overall structural case for, for China. So um, slide 13, the next theme is around uh, uh, diversification. Uh, given the focus on the domestic market, Chinese equities offer diversification potential for investors, uh, a characteristic that has continued throughout the recent volatility. So you look at uh, here, Asia's are less correlated to DM equities than their EM peers. And this low correlation uh, has persisted during periods of market stress. A shares also have a, a correlation of less than 0.5% uh, 0.5 to DM equities, whereas the correlation between broad EM equities and their DM counterpart is over uh, 0.7. And it's a similar story for China bonds as well, which have a correlation of less than 0.2 to DM equities versus 0.8 for uh, broad emerging market debt uh, uh, indices. And now I want to very quickly deep dive a little bit on the, on the case for uh, China A shares. And I want to stand out by using a different, <laughs> different background here. So the Asia companies, why China A shares? R&D input has been growing at a rate that is really incomparable. Look at kind of the R&D growth for developed markets. So it has been kind of being comfortably above 15% uh, uh, over the last uh, 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 five uh, years or so, which very much kind of speaks to the tech, uh, tech story that make up a large part of the Asia uh, indices. Another reason is to look at domestic driven uh, economy. So here we talk about trade war, uh, China export to the US, US export to China. You know what? China is increasingly a, a, a domestic driven uh, uh, economy, which has been the long uh, uh, transition goal. Uh, and, and you see how much the export to U.S. has been in decline, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter as much because, uh, uh, because we're talking about uh, uh, an environment where uh, the consumption is becoming a lot more dominant as drivers for, for, domestic, uh, for domestic growth. And I also want to kind of talk about the, the, the consumption resilience. So despite a trade war, macro slowdown, and now more recently, COVID crisis, the cons consumer confidence uh, index has been on the way up. We had a bit of a dip early on this year, but it's, uh, it's been rebounding uh, uh, as well. And, 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 and that gives us confidence that despite kind of the uncertainty with the U.S. going into election later this year, uh, the growth picture is, 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 is reasonably, reasonably robust. And I want to quickly kind of fly through the innovation piece because tech is such a big piece when it comes to investing in China. China has filed the highest number of patents globally since 2011. Uh, R&D spend, we talked about 30% of global uh, R&D spend, uh, and Asia's technology companies are also significantly increasing R&D, as you can see in this, uh, in this slide as well. And um, lastly, when we talk about kind of tech champions, China is driving the future in telecommunications. So if you look at number of 5G contracts, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very high in, um, in, uh, in, in, in China, China companies. So it's very quickly establishing in itself areas of tech dominance that is going to position China very comfortably and very competently alongside the U.S. And I want to really uh, show that very quickly. And lastly, uh, 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 I also want to kind of show the potential of um, uh, and the investment opportunity of investing in China Asia's market. You can see that listed China companies have doubled in the last decade. Um, here you can see the purple line here versus uh, the more established uh, investment universe in the US, in the UK, in Japan, they're practically uh, um, plateauing. So the opportunity set is growing in China and to be It'd be really a shame to, 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 to let that, to let that uh, pass. Uh, and, uh, uh, and looking at uh, uh, um, listed companies and also uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the sectors, right? So you look at private companies. Uh, they have been benefiting from capital markets uh, uh, opening up. Uh, people look, think about kind of uh, China uh, uh, um, investment opportunity. They think that a lot of that is state-owned. Um, you know, how do you invest into, into, into the private uh, company growth? And we see that a lot of the new IP 
IPOs, they come from the private sector. So the increasingly you are able to kind of uh, uh, have a, 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 a more diverse investment universe uh, by looking at the, 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 the direction of travel in terms of the composition of Chinese, uh, of Chinese equity market. And I also want to show that uh, when we see private companies, they have a higher uh, return on equity compared with state owned. So the direction of travel of the equity market being more uh, towards private uh, companies is definitely uh, a, a welcome uh, trend for, 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 for the equity market uh, development. And, uh, and lastly, also showing share buyback that has been supporting U.S. equity markets uh, return uh, is also becoming more and more popular in, uh, in, in China as uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the corporate law uh, uh, increasingly allows for that. So very much uh, a kind of um, a, a nascent of kind of this kind of practices supporting return. And we, and we, and we see how that has really helped the U.S. equity markets, the, 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 decades long bull market and we see that supporting Chinese equity market as well. And, um, and, and, and lastly, kind of a little bit more about China equity uh, deep dive is that um, people worry about uh, China governance uh, adopting global best practices and we see the number of companies becoming more uh, on board with uh, the, the, the responsive investment actually increasing. So it is increasingly connecting with the global standards. And, um, and that, in our view, very much shapes and argues for the structural trends of, uh, of, owning, uh, of owning more China. And the last point I will make around Chinese equities before we go to China bonds uh, uh, exiting this deep dive is around kind of the maturity of the market. So previously we see suspended companies as a percentage of total stocks spiking, right? Like at times of market stress. And that has scared some international investors, but we see that stabilizing a lot, as you can see here in the, in the, in the yellow bar. So that makes us uh, uh, quite a bit more comfortable about investing, investing in China. So that's the little detour about Chinese equity uh, market. Um, and then now quickly around China, China bonds, we see that the, the yield investment, the, the investment case for, for yield pickup in, in developed markets is, is becoming very desperate. We're talking about, you know, zero rate, negative rate environment for three years and longer, basically for the foreseeable future. So central banks are taking income away. And where do you get income? You have to be a lot more thoughtful, considerate uh, about where you get income and how you get it. And China bonds really are very well positioned to benefit from, from this trend. Uh, and, and I would uh, very much uh, uh, draw attention to the fact that investors are catching on to that trend as well. We see here that uh, uh, risk diversification, higher expected growth uh, uh, than the U.S. Uh, reasons cited by our investors uh, when we uh, when, when we when we uh, this survey was done towards the end of last year as reasons for for, for going into China. And I would quickly show that despite that investors are increasingly recognizing the investment opportunities in China, the, 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 the flows are, uh, are rather differentiated and not really uh, in, a, in a very, uh, in, a, in, a, in a super sizable way. So we haven't seen a lot of inflows into emerging markets so far this year. A bit of inflows into China um, through single country, but that has come out uh, 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 more recently. So, so I think the, the sentiment towards emerging market has, has yet to warm up uh, because of COVID and because of concern around kind of emerging markets, if they are well positioned to, to, to fight that. And because of that, the, the adoption of China is being stalled, even though the, the, the investment case for China is getting increasingly, increasingly uh, well recognized. And here I will just uh, quickly uh, show you that a lot of uh, clients, uh, we did this little survey uh, earlier um, last month, a lot of clients, they want to be selected in emerging markets and EM Asia is their favorite uh, destination. And that is predominantly driven by a, a preference for China within, uh, within EM Asia. So um, I'm going to actually stop here because uh, I, I left the, the, the last part of the presentation as the structural case for, for investing in China uh, you know what? I, I will quickly, I will quickly fly through. It's really clear. We made a case for investing in China. A few key killer stats in one minute, and then we'll we'll take more questions. China is big, second biggest economy in in in, in the world, uh, second biggest equity market, second biggest bond market. But foreign ownership is only three percent. That compares to forty thirty percent for comparable emerging market counterparts. So really, really slow foreign ownership here. 
and um, it drives uh, it's the growth engine for global growth. We spoke to it already. It's one third of the incremental global growth, more than the U.S. But the, the people don't own China, and that is uh, that I don't. We think that that is going to change. And here, very quickly, you show how the markets have become a lot more accessible in recent years, uh, and, um, and and we think that that is definitely going to uh, support as uh, investors. Uh, investors own, um, own more and more China and the index providers are waking up to that. We're estimating $250 billion of the flows into China equities and bonds just of announcements from index providers last year alone. So uh, this direction of travel is, uh, is unmistakable and we want to be your partners as you think about uh, going to China for your portfolios. And I will stop here. And I think we're ready to take some questions. Thank you very much, Wei, and um, that's amazing. I planned a trip in April this year, and for obvious reasons, that didn't happen to China. <laughs> um, but listening to you now, I'm even more determined to go and witness this phenomenon for myself. Um, before we start, because there's lots of questions, let's just do a quick poll. You should see the question coming up on your screen now. Um, and also, if I look at the questions, this is a, a, the question is exactly going to be addressed in, in the poll as well. What would hold you back from allocating to China? Geopolitical tensions, risk management concerns, data transparency, or maybe nothing. I want to increase my China allocation. Let's see. Still running, so let's just give her a second or two. Yeah, there's lots of questions. And if we do run out of time, what we'll try and do is actually um, look at some of the questions and we can specifically on the product as well, as Cedric, we'll try and answer some of those questions. Um, and then we can, uh, maybe way we should get you back. <laughs> uh -huh, I'll be happy to be back. <laughs> because there's really a lot of questions. Okay, that seems to be the end of the poll. Very interesting. So you have done an excellent job. If you look at 38% says nothing, I want to increase my China allocation. So it would have been interesting to see that percentage right at the, at the beginning of the, the webinar. Um, data transparency, geopolitical, geopolitical tensions, and then the risk. So it is interesting. If I look at all the questions, you can almost group them into um, three different ones. The data transparency, definitely um, one, then the decoupling, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and ask you a question to summarize most of the questions, and then also the access, like you say, the whole alphabet of, of shares. So let's just start with, I think, with the dual political tension. Yeah. There is a growing debate around the possible decoupling of economic ties between the U.S. and China. Can the combined effect of a pandemic on top of a trade war change? the investment case for, for China. So what is your view on this and, and all the different scenarios? How can it impact the case for, for, the, for China? I think it's, um, it's, there isn't really a huge amount of suspense in terms of the US-China relationship as we go into the US uh, election in November. Uh, it's a bipartisan sport to be harsh on China. It seems to gain domestic popular, popular votes. And, 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 and I think this is going to be a narrative that President Trump and and, 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 and Joe Biden will certainly, will certainly go loud on. So, so I think that the trade tension will be there. And that is in the price because, um, because if you look at what has been uh, uh, driving uh, China market performance, it's, um, it, it's, it's mostly from the fact that it's come through stronger in the domestic recovery. It's, um, it's a, a company profitability pre COVID crisis was improving because of reform. Uh, uh, it, it's, 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 um, it, it's because of easing, domestic easing that are very targeted towards domestic, domestic uh, economy. And all of that, just to say, even if the tension with the U.S. were to intensify and, 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 and escalate, it may impact the day-to-day -day price action. But the longer-term investment case for China is increasingly decoupling from, from, from its, its trade relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the U.S. The COVID crisis, you talked about the juxtaposition of COVID and the, 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 the trade relation, its impact on China, that, that is a bit more uncertain. 
Um, right now, markets are, are feeling quite good about the fact that the manufacturing part of the economy is almost back up to pre-COVID level and it's pricing that in. But if we have outbursts of second waves that is, that is harder to control uh, or it can only be controlled through another complete log- lockdown of the economy, then we have to price in not this, uh, this current, this uh, swoosh type of recovery. We have to price in a W-shaped recovery or, or a U-shaped recovery. And that, that could impact kind of the, the, the performance of this year. But our, our expectation is that um, we will have pockets of outbreak, but, but we're not going to have like a complete shutdown of the economy like what we saw earlier this year um, and, and, and all of that. If anything, China has been more prudent in opening up and, and more effective in managing the spread of the virus. And, and that gives us some comfort, especially when it comes to differentiation based on which country has done better. China is, is, is better positioned uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. Thanks, Wei. I'm going to go to the second grouping of questions. It's very much about the data transparency. There's specific examples that people also um, mention. So investing in China is not without risk that we know. And it has often been criticized for the lack of transparency, but also selective disclosures and regulatory differences with the West. How significant is this risk? And is it probably, prob- properly being addressed or is it fueling a trust deficit? How concerned should we as investors be about uh, investing um, about this specific risk? This is a, this is a great question. And, 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 and it speaks to the importance of doing proper due diligence uh, in terms of understanding uh, what comes out of uh, uh, data reporting. And also it speaks to the importance of, um, of uh, getting reliable sources of data beyond the official uh, data providers. So uh, uh, from BlackRock, we monitor various sources of uh, data, the, 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 the public uh, published data from the, from the authorities, of course, but also independent data providers that, that allow us to, 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 to get more granular breakdown of, uh, of different parts of the, the economy and also big data. Uh, so, so during COVID crisis, we, uh, I would say traditional data failed us. And, and this is not just a China phenomenon. This is a phenomenon in the US. If you look at the, 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 the swing of data month to month, you can see that, that that's not something to base your investment judgment on. But big data really stepped up in its, uh, in, in its in, in significance in helping investors make investment decisions. So we were closely monitoring credit card transactions. We were closely monitoring food traffic around shopping malls. We were closely monitoring uh, the, 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 the intercity uh, transport are the lorries moving, and and uh, uh, well, we were closely monitoring uh, the, the, the 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 satellite imageries. Uh, the, the are the ships leaving the the, the the port for us to try to get a better grasp of uh, the, the actual state of uh, economic uh, activities, electricity consumption, for example, and we and we compare that with the official data that we're getting. And, and, and try to spot discrepancies and where there is that delta change within uh, uh, sports potential investment opportunities because that's where uh, our edge in understanding the data a bit better can, 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 can result in better investment, investment outcomes. So, so, so it's a very good uh, uh, point about not taking data at face value. Uh, both on the uh, kind of a macro and also corporate uh, uh, level. Data transparency is getting better, but we have to supplement that with, with big data, alternative sources of data. And, and, and when we do, do that, we were, able to, we were able to get a better, better picture and, and that resulted in better investment, investment outcome. Thank you very much. And that leads to my last question, because there's a lot of questions about the accessibility of China as well. Um, and you have referred to the, the alphabet of shares. Um, the product that we're launching now is based on MSCI China that includes A shares, H shares, all these different kind of shares. Um, and then you have also the MSCI emerging one where China has got a good uh, accessibility, but over the years, so historically it's been a big problem, but what would be the next uh, steps to improve accessibility and are there certain hurdles to overcome to put that in motion because in a way as western investors we do feel maybe there's a disadvantage when investing or that that could be another question <laughs> so yeah accessibility last question because we are already running running over time i i, I would say that accessibility has improved uh, significantly and that is both a push and pull 
uh, 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 factor because uh, for index providers to increase their index inclusion, they require and demand better accessibility, better liquidity, and better repatriation, transparency, and all of that. And that's what we have been getting from 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 Chinese uh, uh, Chinese uh, Chinese market. So I cited just now when I was deep diving into the equity market, the suspension rule. You know, like when markets sell off, you suspend most of the companies, and how do you, you know, that's that that's not really a operating uh, market. And 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 taking uh, feedback from the well, the bad feedback from 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 the from the episode of most of the companies being suspended, this is not really workable. You see suspension significantly decreasing. And, and this is just one example of how there is greater connection with kind of the international international standard. And I think the direction of travel is, is very clear. Uh, markets will become more accessible. Uh, the, the, the settlement cycle will become more linked up with the international standards and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the logistic uh, logistics required to open up accounts to access the connect program the stock connect the the, the bond connect program have simply have have simplified a lot compared with the q fee rq fee which was uh, the, the 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 qualified foreign institutional uh, investor quota that was a lot more complicated than what people have to do this these days and 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 to to Helena to your point about the launch of the new MSCI China product that actually is the perfect example of how innovation uh, in product uh, launch is really bridging the gap of uh, the accessible uh, accessibility uh, uh, is really bridging the accessibility gap because now anybody that have a a simple vanilla stock account will be able to access China uh, Asia will be able to access well a basket of global stocks. And I think it's precisely because of innovation like this, both what you are uh, talking about today and also in other markets that have really made the, the, the market so much more, so much more, uh, so much more accessible. And I would stress that this is really what the, uh, what the local authorities want uh, right now. Look at stock markets um, the, 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 the liquidity, uh, most of the players are domestic uh, players, right? We talked about the foreign ownership being only 3%. That is not really good because that makes it more junky. Uh, that that's that that's you know that that sort of profile brings potentially more volatility. So the authorities definitely want foreign investors to participate in the in the stock market. Uh, they want uh, institutional clients, uh, diversified client profiles to participate in the in the in the stock market. So whatever it takes to attract a client interest from from like of South Africa, like of uh, other parts of the world, they are going to do that to, 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 to make sure that uh, the, the, the investor profile is diversified and, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a more mature, it's a more mature market. So, 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 so I would say made long progress uh, from 20 years ago when markets first became kind of possible for international investors to invest to where now anybody with a stock account can, can access and the direction of travel is, is really, is really just one way. Thank you so much. We, uh, we will have to, uh, unfortunately leave it here, but, uh, you can see, I mean, everyone attending the school could see the enthusiasm and the passion, um, from way. And, uh, I would love to have you for an, for another session, but, uh, thank you so much. And we hope that we are sending a couple of South African investors your way now. Uh, <laughs> thank you for fun. having me. Yeah. Enjoy. Enjoy everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening and enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much.